Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, the short video is part of a series of chats I will be having with various authors who contributed a chapter to a forthcoming, forthcoming edited book by myself and Hassan Bougrin called A Brief History of Economic Thought from the Mercantilists to the Post-Keynesians. The idea for this book came about a few years ago when my uh, co-editor and myself, we were discussing the availability of history of thought books from a heterodox perspective uh, aimed at an und undergraduate audience. And we felt there was a lack of available books there. And this is where the book comes from. But in addition to this book, we wanted to do a series of a dozen or so video chats where we sit down with each author of the book to discuss the salient arguments of their respective contributions and to have a general discussion over history of economic thought. Now, this book is intended for an undergraduate audience. I'm hoping that those uh, 10 to 15 minute video chats will be used as a pedagogical tool along with the chapters. I think students will learn a lot from these videos. Today's discussion is with none other than John King, whose chapters on Keynesians, uh, and more precisely on the Keynesian school and the neoclassical synthesis. John is an emeritus professor at La Trobe University and an honorary professor at Federation University Australia. His principal research interests are in the history of heterodox economic thought, especially Marxian political economy and post-Keynesian economics. Recent publications include the distribution of wealth with Michael Schneider and Mike uh, Pottinger, A History of American Economic Thought with Samuel Barber and James Siccarelli, and The Alternative Austra Austrian Economics, dealing with socialist economic thought in Austria between 1900 and the present day. And I should add two additional books. Um, his uh, a very famous book on the history of post Keynesian economics and one of my favorite books of his on the micro foundation uh, delusion. Um, so welcome, uh, John. And Thank welcome, you. John. And um, so we have a bunch of uh, maybe seven questions or so. And um, the, I'll begin with the first, which is about Keynes and Keynesians. This book contains many contributions with similar sounding titles on Keynes, on the Keynesians, on the new Keynesians, and on the post-Keynesians. And this may confuse some students. Uh, so what are all these Keynesians about? And your specific contribution is on the neoclassical synthesis, uh, Keynesians that John Robinson called bastard Keynesians. Can you tell us in a few words the grand essence of Keynesians and why they are called bastards. It all goes back to Keynes himself, who makes some almost contradictory statements. You remember, I, I quote in, in the book, he, uh, he writes to George Bernard Shaw, the playwright, to say that he, the book he's working on will revolutionize economics in the course of the next 10 years. And then in the book itself, he says, once um, policy is oriented to restoring full employment, Classical economics, by which he meant mainstream neoclassical economics, will come back into its own and will basically take over. So on the one hand, revolutionary, on the other hand, basically quite conservative. And there's this ambiguity, I think, runs through the microeconomics of the first 20 or 30 years after the publication of the general theory in 1936. And, and people are still arguing about whether Keynes was in fact a theoretical revolutionary, a theoretical radical, or basically just a theoretical conservative. And politically, of course, he was a big L liberal, but he was also a small L liberal. He believed basically in the operation of a free market economy, but one in which the macroeconomic problems that he'd identified were being dealt with. So no easy answer to that question. Uh, yeah, well, you, you, so you mentioned a few things that I wanted to ask you next, and I'm not gonna, I'm going to ask you to maybe elaborate on it. Um, you mentioned whether Keynes was a radical. I mean, you know, we we do come to think about Keynes as, as you mentioned, the revolutionary thinker in economics, the founder of macroeconomics. Um, 
And I myself, my own progression as a scholar has been to sort of move away from Keynes more and more and towards other scholars like uh, Michael Kieletsky, for example, who's also, um, we have a chapter on Kieletsky in this book. So I wanted if, I wondered if you could elaborate on, on the idea of whether Keynes was a conservative uh, in terms of policies. We know that he didn't want to overthrow the system. He wanted to reform it. Um, so does that make him a reformer or does that make him a conservative? He would probably have said that you could be a conservative reformer, that the only way of maintaining the viability of the capitalist system that he'd grown up in and quite liked was to make sure that it was reformed so that the huge macroeconomic problems that had emerged in the early 1930s would be overcome. And so that there was no inconsistency really with being a conservative and a reformer. And in the 1930s, and I think through to the, the 1950s, 1960s, this was a viable proposition that a lot of people would have supported. In 2022, it's probably less um, widely believed in. And people who regard themselves as conservatives think the system doesn't need to be reformed. And people like us who regard ourselves as reformers wouldn't want to be described as conservatives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, one, um, uh, one of the key, so the neoclassical synthesis, as I understand it, and as many understand it, was this idea of integrating or bringing key insights of Keynes with neoclassical um, economics, whereas Keynes has been reduced to uh, a special case. And, uh, you know, Caldor, Nicholas Caldor once wrote that Keynes himself uh, planted the seed for neoclassical synthesis to occur because of the contradictions in this book that you alluded to. Um, and one of the key players or key authors of this synthesis is Paul Samuelson, who wrote the first economics te uh, textbook. Same question. Was Samuelson a conservative, a radical, uh, his policies, his theories. Uh, can you shed light on that, please? Samuelson, I think, was a New Deal Democrat, which in 2022, again, will place in quite a long way to, to the left in, in politics. In the late 1930s, it was almost uh, the mainstream position in, in, in the United States, as I understand it. The notion that capitalism could be preserved but needed substantial reform with a much greater degree of state intervention in particular macroeconomic issues than had been regarded as legitimate up to then. I think the um, I think the, the depth of the, of the Great Depression in the United States shifted the whole political uh, political um, environment to the left and, and, and Samuelson was part of that so by the 1960s, 1970s, when there was a, a distinct sort of far left wing in the United States, Samuelson was regarded as a conservative, but I think that was probably a mistake. And uh, in the context of the day, he was, he was you know, a, a moderate radical, moderate radical reformer. Thank you. Um, so, you mentioned uh, the New Deal. These were certainly inspired, inspired by Keynesian policies. Uh, let me ask you, are Keynesian policies the economics of Keynes? And um, does the answer really matter now? Okay. <clears throat> the answer to the first question is, I guess we'll, we'll never really no, because Keynes did very little theoretical economics after the publication of the general theory. His health deteriorated and then the war began and he was a full-time public servant for the duration of the war and then he died in 1946 and never really got round to writing his definitive appraisal of what were known in his lifetime as Keynesian policies. But I, su I suspect he would have been relatively happy with the, the Samuelson approach to uh, macroeconomic policy. 
might have been a bit less um, happy that the, the man was American because th there was this um, notion that the uh, you know the, the, the upstarts across the Atlantic weren't to be taken particularly seriously, which um, all upper class English economists of this period tended to uh, adhere to. But yeah, I, I think um, I think Samuelson and, and, and Keynes would have been on the on the same on the on the same page. Yeah. You know, I I uh, I understand what you're saying. But I hope you realize that this, these are fighting words for many of our uh, colleagues who would uh, find, uh, uh, be very offended by that comment. But I certainly understand. Uh, and it is something that I've, I've tried to reconcile um, as well. Uh, another economist, the father of the so-called ISLM model, John Hicks, or J.R. Hicks, as he, he was called then, uh, played a role in all this with his 1937 interpretation. Um, I'm told he was known as the world's most boring lecturer. Uh, can you tell us more about Hicks? Very little, because I, I was a, a student in Oxford in 1964 to 67 and went to one of Hicks's lectures and vowed never to go back. It really was extremely dull. The only person who ran in close was Roy Harrod, the famous growth theorist who uh, also tended to read from notes and not look up and, and not raise or lower his voice at any point. And so there was this really tedious monologue. And we had this belief, which may or may not have been justified, you could simply go away and read what they'd written and, and um, you'd learn everything you needed to that way and personal contact and personal attendance at lectures wasn't um, particularly helpful. In a sense, I suppose I regret that now, but I did go to uh, one set of lectures, the um, growth theorist, Robin Matthews, does that name ring a bell? Author of a famous, very long um, survey of growth theory that came out in, I think, 1964. And he, he gave a course of lectures based on that. And I went to all of those. Not sure I understood everything, but certainly learned a lot. So it was possible to be a very good lecturer and also to be a, a, a sort of a solid, intelligent Keynesian economist, but you could be a solid, intelligent, innovative Keynesian economist and a rotten lecturer, and I'm afraid Hicks and Harrod were in that, uh, in that category. Thanks. Now, if you hear a dog barking, that's my dog Maynard. Right. Ah. Uh, okay. Um, so, of course, Hicks um, sort of repudiated his famous model in 1979 or 1980. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, to, to put that there, but the model does remain very well used today in most textbooks. Now, let me ask uh, something about economic performance. Um, now, whether Keynesian policies are policies that Keynes would have supported or not, um, one thing is very clear. We call them the golden years of capitalism or in, in French, le temps glorieuse. There's no denying that capitalism worked for a period of about 25 years, uh, right after the war till, till about 1970. Um, why do you think that was? Yes, very, very good question. Monetarists would tell you that it was, um, it took 25 years before inflationary expectations began to dominate people's ways of thinking about their economic um, decision making. And you can see why they got there. I, I suspect the answer has something to do with the, the um, very slow um, development of trade union militancy in, in this period. And the, um, I don't know, gratitude, contentment with this period of very long very substantial full employment. Remember, we're talking about unemployment at 2% 2, 2 or less in countries like Britain and, and large parts of Western Europe, which compared with the, the 20 plus percent unemployment in the 1930s was a, was a huge improvement. And, and this, this made people much more content with their lot. Again, a period of low inflation, single digit inflation, no sign of accelerating inflation until the end of the 1960s at the very beginning. So people, Ordinary working people found themselves in a much better um, economic state than their parents had been. And they, um, you know, they welcomed that. And to some extent, they gave credit to the 
governments, the politicians, and the economists behind the politicians who allowed this to come about. And it wasn't until this sort of gratitude wore off and a new generation, my generation, um, reached, came of, came of age and hadn't had the experience of the 1930s, didn't have the same reasons for feeling the gratitude and the small c conservatism that went with it. And it was the revival of trade union militancy and the origins of the wage push inflation, the cost push inflation that dominated the 1970s. I think that was the underlying cause of, um, cause of all the trouble. And it probably was inevitable. And you, you can almost see where people like Robert Lucas are coming from. If you have a long period of very tight full employment, sooner or later, inflationary expectations are going to, uh, are going to pick up. And we still haven't really completely reconciled low unemployment and low inflation worries, even in, in 2022, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I always tell my students that um, everything started falling apart, starting in 1980, more or less, with this so-called neoliberal era. And then if you compare both, you know, the Keynesian era with the neoliberal era, uh, it it's quite a, a stark contrast between the two, uh, the two periods. And so the Keynesian sort of era ends with the inflation of the 1970s. And like I mentioned, you had the rise of, you know, monetarism and rational expectations, both topics being covered in this book. Uh, you wrote a fantastic book, which I mentioned at the top, uh, called The Micro Foundations Delusion. And this refers to sort of modern macroeconomics. Um, my question is this, very simply, uh, is old Keynesian economics better or worse than mainstream macro in 2022? And precisely on this point about the alleged need to provide micro foundations, I think old Keynesian economics, which didn't make that assumption, didn't search for the possibility of reducing macroeconomics to microeconomics, which saw macroeconomics as having a separate status, separate standing of its own. On all those characteristics, I think old Keynesian economics better than new Keynesian economics. And an awful lot of intellectual energy and theoretical um, skill that's been wasted in this micro foundations delusion um, didn't dominate the old Keynesian macroeconomists. And, and I'm, I'm inclined to very strongly to, to think that on that question, at least an important methodological, philosophical question, old Keynesian economics has it over new Keynesian economics. And yeah. I suspect if Keynes were to come back today, he would agree. Oh, I'm sure he would. I, I'm certainly sure he would. Uh, well, John, um, that uh, we can't, we're at the end. Okay, everyone, thank you very much, John. This was about uh, 18 minutes, so not too bad. Uh, thank Great. you very much. Nice seeing you again. Stay safe. Okay. Yeah, and you. Bye okay. for now. Bye-bye, John. Bye.